pass out, just kind of, you know, evenly distribute this. We'll give a couple here. You guys take a look at it. A couple here. And take a look at <laughs> the Freedom Summit is scheduled for this coming Valentine's Day in February. Okay, you can do that later. She can collect the money while you she's doing that. <laughs> you can get your signatures from everybody you collect money from. You know, stuff out. <laughs> now they're going to do individual checks today. So go ahead and you know, wrap it up. Skip to the end. You can do it later. Is that where you're going to stand for the rest of the time? i got to find a seat. I don't see any seats here. Back here. There's a seat over there. Summit. If you look on the back, you probably recognize some of the names. What we're going to do is I go ahead and give me one of those. Now, the names probably some of you will recognize a lot of them. I'm going to tell you who they are. The Freedom Summit has been, I mean, this is it's turning into a thing in competition with other freedom festivals and so on. Ours is unique, it's a little bit different. When I go to, the, like, Libertopias went last weekend, you'll have 30, 40, here, I'll, I'll, I'll get sick, okay, is that good? You have 30, 40 speakers in four or five rooms, and you go through, and you want to see this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, and I miss half of them because they're speaking at the same time. So I'm going, you know, nah, to, and then out of 30 speakers, I really only wanted to see five of them anyway. So. Over 10 years ago, the first one was three weeks after 9-11 in 2001. And we've had a lot of speakers, a lot of guys you probably know, probably more recognized. Three times at the summit has been Ron Paul. I mean, you know, so it's, it's the boys. You know, Lou Rockwell, Walter Block, Bumper Hornberger, uh, you know, James Bovard, I mean, on and on and on and on. And what happens is we try to create, it's called the summit because everybody gets to participate. They speak for 45 minutes, it's part in the contract. I put in the contract. There's two main things. One, I pay for you to come out here and you're scheduling to do. No, I'm not paying for you to come out and visit your brother-in-law for half the time you show up for your speech. You're there at the summit. People want to interface with you, they want to talk to you. Most of the summit is done and we have many breaks, they're all catered, you have continental breakfast, you get the dinner. The whole package is like, you go there, you're there, okay. Vendors have their tables inside the main ballroom. We have, it's all part of one thing, kind of like a family. And people come every year when we do this. Now come and associate and meet new people, network, and a lot of things have come out of the summit. A lot of the things that you see, like the Levolution. Now what happened was, when they do this, a lot of these guys, every one of them, can be a keynote speaker. Heck, a lot of our audience could be keynote speakers. When you look at the list of our previous, you know, on here, you'll just see this listing of all of our previous speakers and then who's coming here. And you'll go, holy crap, you know, gee, they do them back before they was famous. This year we got Cody Wilson. He's the guy that did uh, the 3D printing of the gun. You guys remember the 3D gun? That was a big deal. Well, that kid, man, we, we had him on the show like seven times. We've been trying to keep him alive for a long time, okay? So he's going to be coming speaking. That'll be very interesting. Larkin Rose, all right? You know, if I had to pick somebody to represent, you know what are you, Ernie? I don't know whatever Larkin Rose says, man. Go, go talk to him, okay? He's, he's definitely my representative of not being represented. Now it's like, who represents me? Me, 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 me. You want to hear about how I represent myself? Talk to Larkin about it. Mark Victor, of course, you know, the criminal defense attorney. He's getting a lot of attention here of late. Let me tell you what's going on. He was on TV constantly during the Doney Arias trial trying to explain everything anybody wants to know. All right? 
He's the one that had uh, Elizabeth Johnson, whatever her name is, you know, baby Gabriel case, not guilty. And he knew this before he took the case years before he's gone. Prosecution is so stupid. They charge him because they can't even prove the elements of the case. He goes to the jury. He, no questions. No questions. You sure he meant it? Okay, that's right. No defense. No questions. No questions. Goes to uh, hours of uh, uh, closing argument with the jury. They come back not guilty. And everybody went, what the heck just happened? Well, I'm sure he will tell you about how that happened then. I won't spend the time now. Now, he has another case called the Baseline Killer. How many of you remember the Baseline Killer? How that applies to us as libertarians is we always hear this. you got to have the government. If you don't have government, you know what would you do if there was like a mass murderer or something? Well, let me tell you what the Baseline Killer told us. <laughs> this is what government does or doesn't do. He represents seven, it was, it's a long story, but the bottom line is, is they easily could have caught this person if they just did what they promised to do and took my $40 million order it was to build their new crime lab that they did made a big deal at. We need government to, you know, oh yeah, oh, and their baseline killer and billboards and all this kind of stuff. And all they had to do was test the DNA. They knew this was the same guy that raped two young girls that didn't kill the first victims. What was it seven, eight, nine people died? You know, after that, and he kept blowing it off, and internal bickering and fighting, bureaucracy kind of. And I, when uh, the day that Mark served the suit on the chief of police and the mayor and the city and all that other stuff, I was sitting at a Starbucks with two representatives of the Phoenix Police Department from the Confrontation Prevention Squad or Community Service Squad. It is Al Ramirez. I've known him for decades. We worked together. It was right after Black Man with the AR-15. Okay. And we had worked out well, didn't you go Google CNN Ernest Hancock and you'll see. And what happened was I you know, went up and said, you know, Phoenix Police did their job. They were there to protect our rights to carry our firearms. They knew what we were doing. We've been there. They understood it's all good. Phoenix Police, peace out. Well, really? Yep. They did their bit. We did our bit. We made them look good. Thanks for fine. Now, of course, the fusion de la we rule you department of didn't like it. You know, they didn't want us working with them or anything. So what happened is um, Al asked that I go and have uh, lunch with him and his supervisor at the time. So I said, well, we're really busy after the show and we had the workshop downtown. I'll go and meet you at uh, Park Central Mall, the Starbucks where I was down there. So we went in and we sat down and I said, I'm going to do you a solid, okay? This is how much I love you. It is now 3 o'clock and I knew that's when they were serving everybody. I go, right now your bosses are all being served with a lawsuit of the baseline killer. And I go, when that happens, when you get back, assume we know everything. Now, we had taken all of the evidence, all of the PDF, all of the test, all of the deposition, all the stuff that we had up to that time, and we just dumped it up on Freedom Spans. And any media, if you want to know anything, it's right there on my servers, make me take it off. And who's the attorney they got to go through that's computer geek to try and get and they want to do and everything? Mr. Michael Kilsky, right there. Okay? You know, formerly the state chair of the Libertarian Party, an attorney, a computer geek, and everything. He just loves when they want to try and, you know, make give me a gag order. I can't wait for that one. You know, we're going to have some fun. I mean, you know, bring it on, bring it on, bring it on. So Mark tells me here recently, they did a motion, the city, with the court, you know, trying to get a gag order on all this case. Why? Because of all the information that we have, and Mark getting all this attention in all these cases, he they know, man, this is going to be international. I guarantee freaking did. Because this is what the issue is. They always go to, oh, you damn anarchist libertarians and everything. Boy, you'll need us when there's a serial killer. Maybe not. And the promise that they made, and the money that they take, and the taxes they increase, and all this other stuff did not go to do with simply what they promised. They lied. And I'm going to point it out like you wouldn't freaking believe. Let's go to trial. Mark wants to go to trial. <laughs> so what happens is now they're trying to, they it was supposed to go to trial, finally, after all these years, this month. And they did another continuation, and they're trying to do settlement. Well, we want, maybe we don't want to settle. I mean, it better be some stupid money because we are not set down. Because what's the point? What is the point of government? What is the one thing they threaten you with? At the same time, what was going on? 
They raised the food tax in Phoenix. They had the food tax. We gotta have food. If we don't even raise the food tax because you know, we, we're not ripping you off enough, we need more food tax, or we might have to cut back on the number of <gasps> police having some Murgatroyd. Oh, you mean you reduce the police state if we don't have to? Cool. Next. Yeah, but we'd have fewer cut. Good. And your argument? This is not the argument they want to have. That's the argument I want to have. Now, that brings me to this other point. Hand me that. This summer, there was a Pork Fest 10. Okay, the 10th, the Porcupine Freedom Festival, the Free State Project out of New Hampshire. They have a big camping festival that's up in uh, New Hampshire. It's about a week, you know, just camping and chilling. Some of you have gone. And <clears throat> there was a thing called Agorist Pitch. And it's kind of like the pitch, you know. You know, you're fired or whatever. Anyway, it's a pitch. You go in, this is my great idea. I, my venture capital, give me my idea of I want to make money on my idea. So they come up, and we had, you know, I don't know, a dozen people. They they went through a interview process, kind of a preliminaries, and they selected the top, you know, ten or something like that that came. And I was one of the judges. And they came up, and they go, "Oh, we should do this, and we should do that. This would be a good idea." And how would it impact? Now, this would be a good idea. And kind of, they're going, "Okay." And the guy that won was a guy named Davi Barker. Davi Barker is. Um, uh, and act these bitcoins, not bombs. He really pushes, you know, bitcoins as a uh, alternative currency. He does a lot of other stuff. He's a graphic artist. Did a lot of art for Silver Circle movie. You know, he's one. Of the, yeah. yeah. So you know, these are the guys that he's a good activist. He's well known in the community, and he's got talent. But what happened? His presentation was this: authoritarian sociopathy. And the point that he was making was this: they don't do these experiments anymore. The experiments used to be the Milgram experiment, the Stanford experiment, these experiments to where they show what happens when people are given authority. The experiment requires that you continue to amp up the voltage and kill the guy in the next room because he got the uh, question, the answer to the question wrong. Yeah, but I, he sounds like he's a man. The in your lab coat, they go, the experiment requires that you continue. Okay, screw it, man. And they kill him in their minds. Hey, man, authority said. Then they had another one where it was the prison, you had the guards and you know, versus the, the inmates, and they give them positions of authority. And there's all these kinds of different experiments. And what it did is it started to teach you know, people how this Nazi thing happened. How, how did, how, okay, well, I guess there's a law, I should walk into the Sinai shower. I mean, you know, it's like, you know, how does this happen? Even as a junior high kid, I remember asking myself, how the hell did that happen? But we're seeing it happen. It's a happening. It's like a science that is happening. When they stopped this, they changed the ethical guidelines to where you could not get any kind of funding from universities or the government or grants or whatever to conduct these types of experiments. They didn't want you to, but the government did. What do they call that? MK Ultra. All this went into the, all this mind controlling kind of you know whatever frequency daylight commercial TV cleavage and leg kind of whatever the hell. Okay. <laughs> So as they did this, what happens? You have entire generations that are being molded into whatever the heck we're being molded into. And what Donnie is saying, he's going, there's all these different experiments that they did on different types, perceived authority. I have authority, you're the lo lower caste, what, how do I view you? Do I, you know, experiments of, you know, what do I think I should get away with? Or, and it's like, you know, a lot of times I make the, uh, the point that by even creating government, the shiny badge, you always get the sociopath, the scummiest, that will come, I want my shiny badge, it's my turn to rule. What they're saying in these experiments, yeah, maybe you know, true to a large degree, but what they didn't anticipate was that power brings out the sociopath in everyone. And you remember this one scene of seven hours of Lord of the Rings is summed down into 46 seconds of a cut I play on my show a lot. And it goes like this. Here! You take the ring, Gandalf the wizard from Frodo. No, don't tempt me further. You know, I, I would desire to do good with that power, but through me it would wield such evil. And he goes, well, 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 can't stay in the Shire. That's right, I can't. What do you do? Well, the libertarians are the hobbits. We don't want to wear the ring of power. We want to chuck it in the fires of Mordor. Okay? It's not who wears the ring, it's the ring. 
So what they are finding out is that it, as much as bad people will kind of gravitate towards that, once you get power, you become a bad person unless one thing happens. And all the experiments that he describes, he does a great job, and he printed this up, passed it out in Libertopia. This was the presentation that won a one ounce Liberty round, okay? Liberty dollar, you know, Bernard von Wachkoff. Second prize was $1,000 in Bitcoins. Third prize was 20 ounces of silver. I mean, this was a serious contention, man. They were going for it. They had all kinds of good ideas. But Davi captured the imagination of everyone because he said for the first time, we had the ability, and we have a lot of PhDs and psychologists and libertarians and anarchists and voluntarists that understand this idea. We need to understand what they do and how they've been manipulating it and showing it to everyone. And the bottom line was power only respects the rights of the individual holds themselves to a higher standard, does all the things that you would expect they did, they should do under one condition. When everybody believes that their power is illegitimate. When they don't believe that they have legitimate power. When they believe that they're just an occupying force. When they believe that, you know, everybody knows that they're crap. Kind of what's going on now. Okay? <laughs> when that happens to legitimize their position, they feel they need to legitimize their power and their scope and so on. That's the time when they start doing their job the way they're supposed to. That's the only time. So this is kind of the experiment, and I get into details, and you just need to read it, and you'll see how it's doing it. But they're taking this seriously. They're hoping to present findings by next pork fest this coming June. So they're setting up their ethical guidelines now. He's marketing it to have people participate in doing that. So that's going to be very, very interesting. He's speaking at the summit as well. Judge John Buttrick. He uh, retires from the Superior... Hey, how you doing? Let's go ahead and have a seat. Here we go ahead. <coughs> he retires from the bench so that he could spend more time with his wife that recently died of cancer. Now, what happened was he got took a uh, kind of a more part-time job as a federal magistrate that you know, operates out of the Arizona District out of Yuma. So I'm going, okay, so he's a federal judge. Here's a judge. Now, in 94, he ran for governor against uh, Bash and Symington as a libertarian. Everybody knows him to be like, he was on the National Platform Committee, you know, the, uh, the Libertarian Party National. So he'd been an attorney of mine, you know, a lot of activist cases that we go against the government and all that kind of stuff. Harvard law grad, summa cum whatever the heck, you know, he's senior partner, Brown and Payne, the boy's got skills. Federal judge. What is he going to talk about at the summit? All of you bunch of anarchists, God, we don't need no stinking law. What do we operate under? What is your conflict resolution after all this falls? When the economy goes, the dollar's done, the repudiation of the federal government, debt's not paid, you know, whatever happens, is there going to be any law? How are we going to survive? How are we going to... The last five issues of our magazine has been focused on this point. What happens? Oh, you bunch of anarchists, you don't believe in law. Kind of, you know, of course there's law. But if it's coercive, if it's, you know, preventative, if it's prior restraint, you know, if it's all this, you know, and all this stuff you can't do and all this stuff you have to do, that's not legitimate government. And if I, you know, it used to be the unanimous consent of the governed, and Franklin got Thomas Jefferson to change it. They're like, no, oh, you can't get unanimous. You know, of course it has to be unanimous. It goes down to the individual. That's the whole point. So this is coming back. You know, this whole discussion is raging at the younger generation. And I get into arguments, but, you know, but it's always our age and older. It's the older guys. Like, nah, that'll never happen. I'll sit there and show them exactly. Doesn't matter. Don't care. You'll never have a free market, really. We did an entire issue. They're doing it right now. Big, you know, talks at Libertopia and so on on just Bitcoin. Forbes magazine comes out. eBay does a video on using Bitcoin in their future. eBay. That's not good enough. Really, really. Ernie, you're arguing that you can have unanimous. You can talk at the end. <laughs> <laughs> So what happens is, is it's called, let me tell you what unanimous is, where I spend my money. If I got a gun to my head to take it, that wasn't, un that wasn't consent. And then what I get, 51% put a gun to my head and that's okay? 
You see my point? So it's already happening. You go to Silk Road, there's a place called Silk Road. What Silk Road is, is that, uh, just let me know when you guys are ready. What Silk Road is, is um, a deep web bit and tour. You go on encrypted kind of, you order right now. If you got your smartphone, you go Silk Road, you can order any LSD, heroin, drug, gun, whatever you want on Silk Road right now. And you pay in Bitcoin, and nobody knows how to track it. They get their money, you get it, shows up in the mail. And I'm going, I'm going, wow, and, and nothing's tracked. This has been going on for years. All of a sudden, Forbes magazine starts going, what the hell? This has been going on years, years. And then we had, you know it's legitimate, when Chucky e. Schumer comes out and says, we got to stop them. You can't. Damn it. Don't we have Hellfire missiles or something? So this is not happening later. It's happening now. So while the, a lot of the older generation, they're going, no, they're, they'll, they'll be Alan, okay? But the younger does not care. The, the legitimacy, the opinion, the influence that the older generation used to have, or thought, thinks they have on the younger generation, they're not even listening. And we saw it during the Levolution. Oh, we got to get your candidate on CNN, Will Blitzer and Hannity and, you know, Ryan got blood there. And these younger guys are going, who? They didn't know who the hell you're talking about. So I'm just, you know, whatever. We're going to see it. Coming. That was my presentation at Libertopia, you know, defending our community. That's my whole point is I'm going, look, you guys don't understand where the real battle is. It's in the minds of the next generation. So we'll be talking about that. Anthony Gregory. Anybody that knows Anthony Gregory knows Anthony Gregory Dam. Works for Independent Institute. He just finished an entire treatise, original uh, book from beginning to end, everything on habeas corpus. You know, I had him on my show. I did not know in the Constitution, habeas corpus is optional by the government when we feel like it. It even says it. I'm going, are you freaking kidding me? And we get all about, oh, wait, we're, we're, we're the good guys. Yeah. Rosa Curry, she's Democrats Against Agenda 21. Great speaker, used to work for bureaucracy in Northern California, doing valuation of eminent domain on property. And she's like, something's wrong here. This, this you know, sustained development has some kind of, it's not really fair, and it's, it's not equitable. And we're kind of, all of a sudden, she comes across with we knew, we learned at the breakfast club, Alan, take a quaalude. I know you just <laughs> ready to explode. So <laughs> I'm going to go get breakfast. <laughs> we'll do that in two minutes. <laughs> Char Charles Goy be nicer. Charles Goyette is There's going to be no speaking. I talked to him yesterday. Following next week, he's going to come on my show for three hours in studio. And we're going to see our economy and the war. And man, if that both of them aren't rearing their head. So we're going to be talking about that. Bill Grigg. So you know who Will Brigg is, police state, great, Tim Fry, Robert Stark, Richard Grove, Tragedy and Hope. To so all of the stuff from John Taylor Gatto and the previous guys and digitized it and saved it for generation next and organized it. Man, that's just awesome. Really Frank Tamburi Frank Tamburi is going to be the doctor to talk about how you can practice medicine and not go to jail by just helping people. Butler Schaefer, constitutional law professor, James Babs, kind of like my counterpart in Philadelphia. Dobby Barker we talked about. John and Catherine, uh, they do Blush Family Farm, all self-sustaining stuff. We're doing our aqua dome. We're going to be doing that with them. Greg Peterson, Urban Farms. Paul Rosenberg, you know, Freeman's Perspective, the economist. He's got a lot of things going on. And then we'll be doing stuff on self-sustainability and having radio and this kind of thing. So this is really, we're going to be building up to this, and you're going to see a lot of things happen and change in the movement as we go to the next phase. We'll get more into it and have Jonathan come up after we get some breakfast. Go ahead and line up. Alan's last. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, <come on. laughs> come on, Alan. All right, guys, let me go ahead before Jonathan, while he's finishing his meal, I'll tell you about uh, Libertopia, the Aquadome, the Batman, you know, keep me entertained. Libertopia is in its fourth year in San Diego. What happens is uh, there's a guy named Sky Conway, he's an attorney for the entertainment industry. So he has a lot of contacts with a lot of, you know, uh, ballroom kind of events and so on with Hollywood stars, Daylaw, whatever. He's a science fiction fan and all that. His whole thing <coughs> is called Anything Peaceful and Voluntary. Libertopia, Peaceful and Voluntary. Whatever you want. Well, what can we have? Yeah, as long as it's peaceful and voluntary. 
I went to the point that a lot of people were complaining that, you know, they had the younger crowd. He thought, well, I might get more attendees if I lower the price, if we make it to where they didn't have to buy hotel rooms and everything. And, and we've kind of experienced with the Freedom Summit and so on, the price, you know, people that really want to go to this stuff, you know, they, they pay, you know, and this year they're going to pay. But I get discounts for Bitcoin and silver. You got Bitcoin, I give you big discount. You got silver, big discount. Federal Reserve notes, you're paying full boat. Get over it. <laughs> So what happens is we go to um, Libertopia, and Sky and I have become you know friends over the years, and they have us, they, they give us all kinds of goodies for us to go because they want us to bring the dome. We have the big money dome, we take, we put it in there, and it's really cool inside and everything. Well, where they did it before, Half Moon Humphreys Bay on the marina there was outside, it was beautiful. You got sailboat masts everywhere, outdoor stage, it was kind of cool. So they said, well, they went to this other place, town and country. And it's a beautiful facility. It's really big. It's, it's really nice. And it's an older, been there 40, 50 years, upgraded and so on, but it's a very nice facility. The ballroom, what they did, they told everybody, they go, yeah, you bring the dome, you can just camp in it. In the ballroom inside? Yeah, just camp. Just stay overnight. Don't worry about it. We're like, really? They had negotiated to where we'd have our own people inside. We just stay overnight in security. Don't worry about it. We got to take care of it. So they're telling people, I go to the hotel, like, yeah, what they don't know, or, I mean, you know, they just, you know, didn't worry about it. Hey, peaceful and voluntary, we don't care. So what people did, they would set up, and you would have your 10 by 10 little thing there, they put a little deal, you'd have your table, and you're selling your wares, and your drinks and trash, and whatever you're doing, and there's a tent behind you. People do sleeping bags on the floor. You go around the thing over there, they got a, you know, little canopy kind of, you know, I don't know, naked zombie dancing orgy room for all I know, I have no idea. You know, so this was going on, and we're going, wow, okay, well, we're in our hotel room, <coughs> and, the, sorry. and the people are out there camping, and then all of a sudden, they start to neck to freaked out the next day, like, hell no, and you guys leave, or you get the people out of the old liability and insurance, and somebody's got a shiny badge and said, you can't. Well, what happened the following morning, they were, they were like, there's people in there drink because they were selling homebrew beer. Oh, you can't do that. There's got to be a law, okay? So what happened is they're looking around, and they see an empty one sitting at Alma's Agoras Marketplace. She had a little thing there. Probable cause. She's given her presentation in the morning on Saturday or Sunday, I think it was Saturday. She's giving her presentation early in the morning, like 9 o'clock or something. While she's giving the presentation, they got a security guy all uniformed and so on, and one of the hotel staff searching through everything in her booth. Ooh. Opening up everything, going through it. So the guys at the Freedom's Phoenix thing across the way from, you know, because we're all together and friends, you know, Keith is there taking pictures. So what does she do? You, you call the cops, do you file a suit? How do you take, how does a, a free market kind of guy deal with this stuff? What authority are you going to approach? She goes, okay, all right. Didn't find anything. You know, nothing. You know, no drugs, no alcohol, no, they didn't do nothing. So she takes the pictures, laminates it, puts it up on her booth and said, yeah, you know, well, this is, I guess we won't be here next year, you know, that kind of thing, right? She takes that graphic and the story and puts it up on Yelp. Anybody know what Yelp is? Those of you older people that don't know what Yelp is. Yelp is a rating. It's kind of like you have a AAA or your ranking and the way it used to be before all of this county help and go and protect me from the cockroach infested, they're going to kill me people, that they went out of business because people just didn't go there, you know. So what happens is they have an online service to where you go, I'm hungry. You just go and you hit boom, yelp, I want what kind of food? This kind of food. They go, oh, go to this place, it's the greatest, most wonderful, whatever. Don't go here, the guy's come back and washes his hand. Okay? <laughs> so she takes and puts this up, an evaluation of the entire hotel, tells about the weekend, what they did, how they did it, put it up, and all the comments come back, oh my God, blah, blah, blah. That is the free market solution to these kinds of problems. Don't tell me it can't be done. I see it happen all day, every day, all the time. Blah, 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 blah. It's happening. Right, not later. But it's not perfect. <laughs> perfect enough. They're like, you know, they're freaking out, calling Sky, want to be their buddies now. How do we get that off? We have changed. We're ever so sorry. You know what they did? They went, they go to Sky and say, we're so sorry. And they changed all the locks 
so that only Sky and his staff had the keys and security couldn't even get into the room. That's the impact. <coughs> so that was a good event. We met a lot of people and uh, made a lot of friends and so on. That worked out well. <laughs> we just launched. Okay, we're, Jonathan, are you ready? Okay, we'll get to you in like two minutes. You're ready. So what we did is we go ahead and we decided that um, uh, we're going to continue the defending Archimedes project, and I'll do that another time. We're developing that and such, and you, a lot of you guys already know that. But uh, this month's magazine featured we turned on the aqua dome. We have a double geodesic dome that's connected, put in all the grow beds, got the fish thing going. We have all so all of a sudden now, oh, we're ready to start making some food. We're going to start doing all the planning this weekend. The last weekend, the weekend right before Halloween in October is when we're going to have the Harvest Festival. It's a great pumpkin harvest festival. Little kids encouraged to go pick their own pumpkin that we're growing. And then, of course, we're going to feature all this with the urban farm guys, the Valley Permaculturalist. And what we're finding out is that you have the preppers, survivalists, hope keeper types on the right, are overlapping with the permaculturalist, Birkenstock wearing kind of, uh, you know, tree hugging people on the left, and they find out they got the same enemy. It's the man. This is happening now, and I got nothing to say to the haters. Okay, so Jonathan, go ahead and come on up. Jonathan, I'm sorry, what was your last name, Jonathan? Lockwood. Yeah, Lockwood. Jonathan Lockwood, I met at Libertopia, we did a radio show, and he has such an interesting story that we put it in the magazine, and I wanted you guys to um, experience this. And I'll, I'll, I'll preface it with this and skip to the end. Jonathan is a professional voiceover guy. You go to his site and you listen to it, you go, wow, man, that, I know that guy, you know? So what happens is he's able to take his career with him wherever he can get the internet, you know, load up an audio file. You know, I can read for a movie trailer in Mexico as well as I can here. So what happens is, you go, I can go somewhere. I, I came from a kind of authoritarian culture before and out and kind of on my way to being left alone. Where do I go? How do I do this? Mexico is going to be his, you know, uh, launching point, you know, and he's going to share with us his journey, how he got to where he's at, what he hopes for the future. And at this age, how old are you, Jonathan? 47. At 47, you know, is he too old? Does he get it? What path did he go through? What hurdles did he have to cross? What did he learn that so many of us don't? He's going to share it with us. John. Right, thank you. Right, something about a week and a half ago that is very ill-advised. I went out karaoke with some friends. And I'll tell you what, I did something unconventional. I, I sat down. And Frank Sinatra never sounded better coming out of this mouth. So I'm going to be unconventional today if it's okay with you. I'm just going to have a seat here have a conversation with you. Uh, my name's Jonathan Lockwood. Um, as I already told you, I'm a voice talent. I do radio and TV voiceovers and film narrations. Uh, people always ask me, well, what do you do that I know? Well, lots of stuff. The one that most people here in the uh, Phoenix area know is a, is a national furniture retailer that I do call The Dump. Maybe you've heard those. Oh, yeah. I'm not the guy who, for years, you heard used to go, oh, oh, oh. that's not me. I took over about a year ago. <laughs> so when you see those TV commercials, that's me. But um, I was in broadcasting for 15 years, but it's been a minute since I've done an interview on the radio, and I did that with Ernie here earlier this week. And I kept finding every time we come back from a break, Ernie was trying to focus me, get me to boil it down. And it wasn't until I went back and listened to that interview that I think I finally kind of figured out what the situation is, the angle that he was looking for. So I thought I would share that with you today. Um, <clears throat> when I was 38 years old, I woke up. I came to realize that I was born into the third generation of a now four-generation family that had been completely buffaloed by an apocalyptic religious cult. <coughs> Things were not what they seemed. Then a few Which years call? later, a few years later, I woke up again. I came to see, I came to believe that the United States of America was not exactly what it seemed no. for me either. Jesus. And at some point thereafter, I decided to go. I thought what I would do for you, I wrote a little mini manifesto a little less than a year ago. 
I've just taken some excerpts from it, and this will maybe give you an idea about my train of thought. There's a place in Gilbert I go, that's where I live, it's called Fox Cigar Bar. And I left there and I wrote this. It's just after midnight, November 7th, 2012. President wow. Obama was reelected last night. But curiously, I'm in a good mood. <laughs> it's not because I'm happy about his win, it's because now I know for certain my life is destined for a bit of adventure. Amen. I'm going to begin taking the steps necessary to leave the United States. Even a few years ago, I'd have considered this an exercise in melodrama, not now. The truth is, I've been strongly considering this move for several months. And if Mitt Romney had won, that wouldn't have stopped me. The reason I say this is because I've been trying to look over the shoulder of the American people. They're told these stories, you see. And even though both of the stories I see now are ultimately the same, I'll admit I was still interested in which story they would go with. I don't believe Mr. Romney would have made a substantive difference. Therefore, my hesitations would have been primarily academic in nature. Just maybe a Romney win meant a fleeting chance that enough Americans kind of thought the government's growth in size and scope was something to be concerned about. But I'm thankful that my country persons have made their position abundantly clear. Most of them don't fear the expansion of the state. They don't like it. They don't see a connection between increasing government and decreasing freedom, between growing statism and diminishing opportunity, between a resentment-based squeezing of job providers and a loss of jobs, between an unchecked escalation of debt and an economic crash. I don't claim to know how the coming decades will play out in the U.S., and I can't be certain that finding a new spot on the globe will be substantively better in the long run. But I do believe there will be a serious economic crisis, more confiscatory policies, further diminished freedom, and intensified class warfare, to say the least. Moving somewhere else is the common sense action of moving to higher ground in the event of a flood. Maybe I'm moving temporarily, maybe for good. Maybe I'll have to move somewhere else in the future. Maybe I'll simply live abroad. Maybe I'll decide to renounce my U.S. citizenship. I'm not there yet. But the fact that I don't have all the answers now doesn't mean I can't start moving in the right direction for me. So again, my thanks to the citizens of the United States of America. I do hope things work out much better than I anticipate, but I don't think you know what you're doing, and I'm certainly not hitching my wagon to you. Thanks for making my choice so obvious and helping nudge me into taking stronger ownership of my own life and to a future of adventure and increased authenticity. So the religion I was born into was that of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Oh, okay. Third generation, my grandmother got into it in the, in the 1940s. Approximately 30 family members were involved. I was very involved. I was an elder. I was giving talks on Sunday. They made me one pretty early because I like to talk in front of people. I haven't, haven't done it so much recently. <laughs> um, when you're in that religion, they call it the truth. And you call it that all the time. How long have you been in the truth? Well, how many people have you helped into the truth? Aren't we so glad we have the truth? The truth, 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 the truth. Must have heard that and used that term over a hundred thousand times, I figured, during the time that I thought this organization represented the truth. If you had asked me at that time, why are you one of Jehovah's Witnesses? I would have said, because it's the truth. Big surprise, huh? Amen. Similarly, I think most Americans really do believe that they live more or less in the land of the free, in the greatest country in the world, the place where government cares more. With all respect, and I mean that, to the people and the great things that have been accomplished in this country, and the people who did believe that they were giving their lives or making sacrifices for something bigger than themselves, I just don't see it that way. Amen. So, I don't care how many dramatic songs are sung, or how many really noble stories are told, because I know how groupthink, propaganda, and self-deception work because of my relationship with the organization that I was involved in for so long. 
The next time I am able to sit with one of Jehovah's Witnesses, and as I'll talk about later, that really doesn't happen anymore. If they are willing to talk to me about their doubts about this organization, I'm going to write something on a piece of paper, and I'm going to put it in a sealed envelope. They are the words that that person will almost certainly say to me at some point. And then they say, I'm going to pull it out. But where will we go? You see, when you're one of Jehovah's Witnesses, it isn't just that they teach you you have the only true religion. They teach, teach you that God has always worked through an organization of human beings on earth. And by the way, it's us. So if you tell them this is not what it claims to be, they say, well, if this isn't the truth, where will we go? So my answer to them is when I came to see that this organization was not purported or what it purported to be, I didn't need to know where I was going in order to know that I needed to split. And so I come to see a similar tendency, I think, with some people who ask me why I'm leaving the U.S. Oh, there are some people who don't want to hear that. They get their haunches up right away. Why? Why are you doing that? They want to get into it, you know. I usually tell them, well, I have the opportunity to, you know, like Ernie said, it so happens that I have work that I'm able to do from wherever I live, and I usually go down that path. But when I do talk to people about my personal reasons for thinking it might be smart to get out of the United States, they often ask the same question. Well, if the U.S. is not the place to be, well, where will we go? Where will we go? I no longer identify as a Christian, although I respect my Christian friends a great deal. Um, but I caution anyone from a commitment to the idea that there is a person or a group somewhere who has all of the answers for you. You will at some point be disappointed, sometimes a lot. The trick is not moving from one group's ideology to another. It's learning to settle on your own ideology, even if it's just a simple one. I came to see that this group I was in, and there is a parallel here, folks. I'm not just talking about this religion. It, it, it makes a lot of sense to me to compare these two things. I thought I was making my own decisions in life. That was an illusion. You know, there are so many rules, so many laws, so many doctrines, so many dictates. It's kind of like this. They tell you the truth. This is the truth. Now make the truth your own. You say, really? Okay. Go. Wait, what are you doing? <laughs> well, I'm making the truth my own. You're doing it wrong. <laughs> All right. Make the truth your own. Okay. I'm gonna... What are you doing? You're doing it wrong. In that environment, you don't have your own morality. You're always thinking, what do the people say about this again when you're faced with a challenge or a question? Maybe at some point in your life, you felt maybe in a somewhat less dramatized way than me that that might be the case with you too. It really has only just been in the last, I don't know, five or seven years that I have come to see that I have the right and usually the ability to make my own decisions. So, when it came to leaving a dictatorial religion, I didn't have to decide where I was going before I decided I needed to go. Would I find another organization that claimed to be the sole channel of communication from God to the planet? Would I move in the direction of Another, uh, you know, some other, would I be an atheist? God forbid. All I knew <laughs> is I had to go. It could be that you don't have any idea of leaving the United States. And that's fine. I am not here to talk to you about all of the reasons why I think it might be smart for me to do that. Uh, it, it could be that you feel confident you can ride this out, and I envy you for that. I hope you're right. It could be that the idea of leaving really burns within, but you just don't know how to do it. If a person doesn't think they need to leave the United States, I get that. If a person just doesn't have the circumstances to leave, oh, I get that. But what is a little bit sad to me is the idea that a person wants to, but they're so filled with questions that they're paralyzed and they don't start moving in any direction. 
Or maybe some people have this attachment to this country and just cannot imagine that there's a life somewhere else. So if it's those last two reasons, well, that's the thing that it's, seems a little unfortunate to me, so I thought we could talk about that. See, the trick in this case is not necessarily believing there's another land of the free that's just perfect, nor is there necessarily a particular guy or group who has all the answers. But there are lots of great people who've done lots of great research pulling together information about where you might be able to go and why. There's lots of it. You can find it in the comfort of your computer station in your home. When it came to religion, I did start moving originally in the direction of sort of bare bones Christianity. I met a lot of neat people during that time. I started moving in the direction after that of what some people like to call new age. That was kind of cool. Now, I call myself an agnostic. I don't know. I'm okay with not knowing. I don't think anybody else knows, but then again, I don't know. <laughs> Do you care? When it comes to relocating, my first choice has been Chile. Is it perfect? I, I wouldn't say that. While I sort, sort out certain questions that I have, I've decided I'm going to skedaddle to San Miguel de Allende, Mexico. Is it ultimately the best place to be? I don't think so. But it's the right place for me to go now. That's how I see it. We've got a lot of nice things going for it, and it's a great option for me right now. And over the course of the next year or so, I'll be keeping my eye on Chile and some other places keeping there. You'd like to know where it is? Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll get into that. I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you now. Uh, so San Miguel de Allende is not a very interesting situation. I was there for a couple of weeks here, a couple of months back. And uh, it's not something that is on most USA people's radar uh, because it's not a resort town. And usually when people think of Mexico, they talk about going to the beach. This is not. This is high desert in the state of Guanajuato, north of Mexico City, three and a half hours or so. High desert. I'm going to talk about the reasons uh, why I like that so much. Uh, in fact, uh, I'll go ahead and get into that right now. It's crawling with Americans and Canadians. About 20% of the population are expats. When I went there, I ran into a gentleman who's an art dealer from New York City who's moved there. And he told me at some point, he says, so how would you find the place? And I told him how, and he says, you got to work to find this place. It's kind of like that, folks. It's, I, I don't think that they want this to get out, but it's one of... Uh, the original ex expat cities in Mexico. Uh, it was in the 1930s they started pouring in. A lot of G on the GI Bill, a lot of people came there to study art. So there is nobody alive in this gorgeous little town right now that remembers a time when it wasn't comprised of a bunch of Americans, Canadians, a few Europeans mixed in along with Mexicans. There doesn't seem to be any tension about that. Everybody's been dealing with this all of their lives. So the first reason why I'm going there is it's close. It is an easy jumping off point from the United States for me. Two, although there are very dangerous parts of Mexico, San Miguel is an area that comes nowhere near the paths of the drug cartels and is statistically much safer than most US cities. I had to satisfy myself with that. Um, my daughter is 26 years old. She lives in the Paradise Valley area. She expresses concern about the idea of my moving to Mexico. And I ask her, I say, you know, sweetheart, what city do you know of your entire life that has always been in the top five of cities in the United States with the highest per capita murder rate? Flint, Michigan. She and I both lived in Flint, Michigan for 18 years. And I said to her, when you talk to people about having lived in Flint, Michigan, you know, and they say, what? You live there? What do you say? 85% of all of this stuff was all the north end of Flint, certain other little areas. We never went anywhere near there. Okay. So if that is true of a city, how much more true is that of an entire country? So that's where I came to with reference to the subject of uh, safety. Three, it is cool. Um, cool bars <laughs> and restaurants and clubs that will satisfy you if you like those sorts of things. Little museums, uh, organic markets, uh, farms close by. It's a beautiful little valley, and it feels just like you're in Europe. It's small. Now, the total population technically is about 140,000, I'm told. 
The El Centro area, which is what most people think of as San Miguel de Allende, population of about 80,000 and about 10,000 of them are Americans, which includes a little bit of Canadians in there too. So one thing for me, as a person who does not speak Spanish very well, it takes a little pressure off. In Chile, where I was earlier this year, forget about it, okay? You, you, people at restaurants know English. San Miguel, almost everyone you meet who is a Mexican speaks at least some English, and some of them speak it very well. And if you find someone who doesn't, there are Americans all over the place. Hey, come over here, and they'll, they'll help you out. Um, that made it, it took the pressure off as it relates to that. These narrow cobblestone streets, this, this was one of the original Spanish colonial cities. The architecture is breathtaking. Um, it's a walking city, really, about 15, 20 minutes is the furthest you'll probably walk in this town. Um, if you want to take a cab, nice modern cabs are everywhere. During the day, doesn't matter where you're going, it's going to be about two bucks US. About three bucks at night. That's cool. Four, cost of living. San Miguel is such a cool place, it is a little more expensive to live in many cities in Mexico, but quite a lot less uh, than where most people live in the United States. A friend of mine who lives there, his name is Jim Carger. If you look up that name, K-A-R-G-E-R, -E you'll find that he writes quite a lot. He's a libertarian who is a, 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 you know, a, an attorney by profession from Dallas. He and his wife have lived down there for about 12 years. He's a great ambassador for the city. And uh, he has uh, he's put together a lot of great information, really brought this, uh, this uh, city to life. And he has determined that realistically, the average person in the United States will be cutting their expenses, their living expenses, by at least a third. My, my experience is if you eat out a lot, it could be even more than that. If you want to eat very inexpensively, you can certainly eat for a couple of dollars if you want. But if you want to go to really, really nice restaurants and get a great steak dinner, I'd say anywhere between about 10 or maybe $17 as opposed to the 30 to $50 that you might be paying here in the United States. And it's good stuff, guys. Um, five, <coughs> weather. This was biggie. There are a lot of great places to go but I hate humidity. I really <laughs> if I were in my 20s and it wasn't such a big deal to me, I'd probably go somewhere in Asia. I'm going to talk, I'm going to run down the list of all of the possibilities just for your interest if, you, if you've if uh, you interest in that. But here in San Miguel Allende, again, it's, it's high desert. There is not a month in the year where the average high temperature is less than 73. There is not a month in the year where the average high temperature is above 84. It is... Not quite as arid as it is here, but it's so much less hot and very easy to deal with the slight increase in humidity. And we're certainly not talking about any Miami stuff whatsoever. I could not deal with that. Uh, at night, most of the year, it gets down to the mid to high 50s. Perfect sleeping weather. There's a couple of months of the year where it'll dip down into the 40s, gets a little cold during that time. Um, are you taking a risk? in leaving the United States? I'd have to say, yes. Are you taking a risk staying in the United States? Again, I'd have to say yes. When I left the religion, there were some ramifications for me. I lost my family. In this particular religion, especially if your family is very zealously voted as mine was, and you just, for no other reason, hey, you keep doing what you want to do. But I no longer believe that the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society is the sole channel of communication from God to the planet. You are a wicked apostate. They actually call you part of the evil slave class. Um, and so, I don't know. My mother and father are still alive. My father is 80. My mother is 79. From what I understand, they're still alive. I'm the youngest of four. They all have, you know, families, and, and I, I don't get to talk to them. I have my daughter. She's the one who sees things my way, and she came with me here to Phoenix, and I love her. She's doing great. Um, but the reaction I usually get when I say that to people about my family is they really just, oh, you gotta be kidding me. How can they do that? I'll let you have that, because that's jacked up when that happens. But I gotta tell you what, it is the best and most important thing that has ever happened in my life. The freedom that I have now, when you wake up, from a completely false reality is remarkable. And it's taught me a lot of lessons because I see the potential for self-deception everywhere I go. 
if leaving the U.S. is not something that makes sense to you or is too hard, I get that. I really do. I don't blame you. But if you're staying only because you got so many questions, you're paralyzed, and you just don't know what to do, <laughs> or if you've got this sense that the United States is the only place to be, even though philosophically you've come to see otherwise, it could be that it's time for you to do some thinking, some real soul searching here, if you've a mind to. Uh, it could be that you need to explore the reasons why you want to leave, determine how important it is to you, then do the research. It really isn't that hard. You'll find it easily. Uh, Ernie knows that I was hanging out this weekend with a guy by the name of uh, Jeff Berwick. He represents the dollar vigilante. I'm not involved with them, but uh, they're a colorful bunch. But one thing they've done is they've created these dollar vigilante groups all over the world. And I'm friends with these guys. They've got little Facebook pages and they write stories that really do give you a good idea about what it's like to live in all of these places from all over Asia, all over South America, all over the Europe, in Europe even. Some of them. Um, although there's plenty of stuff to read and people to consult, here comes the point. You may have to shake the idea that somewhere else there's a USA 2.0. Or that someone else is in a better position to make this decision for you. <clears throat> then once you've made that decision, looked at all of the options, weighed everything, find some peace in the fact that you are the person who is in the best position to make this decision. No one else. You've got this. You can afford really quality health care. They have got great medical centers. I, I've never been to them. You, I, I'm trusting what all of these people who look very much like the people I'm looking at right and tell me. It's not all like that. There are some people who can't afford that. And so they're going to go to some options where they got to wait a lot longer and things are not quite as cutting edge, state of the art. But uh, within San Miguel, there is a place, you know, a little over an hour away in Queretaro, that's spelled Q-U-E-R, like that. You know Queretaro? And there are private places there. For me, I was told that probably for insurance that covers a lot, and you know, I'm not real hip to the idea of insurance insulating you from the true cost of medical care, but you know, it, it is uh, how it works down there. It covers way, way more uh, than things do here. And uh, it is unlikely that my cost for that would be $150 a month if I were to want that. And that's the top tier international plan that covers you wherever you go, except the United States. <laughs> you can get that right over that point. Okay, now let's talk about that. That's something I didn't get into. If you want to buy a place in this gorgeous little town, it is surprisingly expensive for Mexico because so many people want to go there. Now, when I say that, what I mean to say is you won't find it's terribly different than here in the Valley. And in some cases, you can go upwards of a quarter million, half a million, a million dollars. There are people there who have little compounds, and they're fantastic. If you want to rent, interestingly, rent isn't quite as expensive as you would think it would be, since real estate's a little expensive there. Um, I intend, Jim has told me, he said, Jonathan, don't buy when you first come here. Most Americans, more than half, go back or go somewhere else after a year. If you stay here two years, you almost always stay. You fall in love and you just can't go. It's a little scary. <laughs> um, so I'm planning to rent, and there, this, this guy who owns the art gallery there in San Miguel and also in Manhattan has a place that he rents for $400 a month, U.S., you know, Chilean pesos, or excuse me, Mexican pesos. Uh, I'm probably going to get, you know, a place that's somewhere in the vicinity of 700 maybe upwards of $1,000 a month for a three-bedroom place. But what about this uh, maid that I've heard about since I was 20? How, how much are they? Uh, <laughs> it's, you know, what you find is it's almost always, for instance, if you rent a place, very often it's included. Sometimes it'll be two times a week, but if not, you just strike up a deal with anybody. And you know, I've heard it's ten to fifteen dollars to clean your entire place, spick and span, and they do an absolutely fantastic job. Yes. Driving time and business for fee. Driving time. And wow. Well, um, I I flew when I went. I stopped down. There are no direct flights that I have found from Phoenix to Queretaro or Leon. Those are two small to medium-sized airports in the vicinity. Uh, you could go to Mexico City, right, absolutely. I, I stop down in, in Houston or Dallas when I go. Um, as far as driving, how far is it from here to Laredo? Oh, 
everybody. That's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to drive straight <laughs> south of Arizona. If you look at the map, go right down, follow it down to Laredo. The thing that you have to worry about as far as security and safety is the border. Okay. So they all say the same thing at San Miguel. Again, nice American people who are very concerned about safety never cross that border at night. You go during the, the daylight hours, they say you're fine, and many of them do it all, all the time. How do you get there? Uh, well, Monterey. Um, say it again? Monterey. I forget where Monterey is. I think you do Juarez, Highway 45 down towards Mexico City, but you, you turn west to go to Caracol, but you're north of Caracol, I think. Uh, yeah, a little bit. There's a, a toll road. Okay. You drive there, you fly there. I fly there. I'm going, since I'm going to be moving my stuff there, I will be getting a truck, dragging my Acura down to Laredo. I do have to hire a broker. Uh, down there to now you can hire a company to do this. It'll cost you you know ten thousand dollars or more. I don't want to do that. I want to spend three thousand dollars. So there's a there's a sort of a licensed Mexican truck that will get your stuff from Laredo to San Miguel for I'm told about a thousand dollars. The broker costs about a thousand dollars. They deal with all of the legal stuff between the United States and, and Mexico. How did you visit? I flew. To where? I flew. I stopped down in uh, either Dallas or Houston. I think it was Houston, and then on to Querétaro. And how did you get from there to the place? Oh, uh, a driver? Oh, there's there are so many people there who will hook you up. Uh, in my case, Jim got me a, a town car. This guy stood there all dressed up, nice Mexican guy, spoke a little English, had my name up there, you know, that was cool. Never had that experience before. And we just drew uh, the countryside, beautiful, you know, rural area. I want to get this gentleman's question. <laughs> yes, what about uh, capital flight, taking your resources with you, like from your bank account? I understand the feds well, are stepping in and making it more difficult. Right. It's an interesting question because if you're moving, for instance, if you're moving precious metals, the story apparently has to do with, well, you're not supposed to move any more than $10,000. Right. Well, does, is that the face value of your, of your ounces or is it the value of it? Nobody seems to be too clear on that. A little skittish. I'm not the right guy for that, but there are a lot of people out there who tell you What exactly. about the banks? Yeah, well, I, I am... I, had a relationship with a, a bank called Monex. Now, I'm lucky because I have this Jim Carter who loves to help people with this. And he's analyzed all the banks, very skittish about banks. And this Monex was originally a currency uh, sort of trading uh, organization in the beginning. In fact, Monex was started by the guy who wrote that book, Inclined to Liberty, that was getting out of Libertopia that you, somebody's got sitting up over there. Um, Monex does not loan. They do not engage in loaning, which to Jim's way of thinking makes it much safer. Um, and so that's what I, they have a lot of personal services, this particular one, and so I'm kind of trusting Jim in this regard. And, and the thing that you can do in transferring funds, you can wire it and you're able to hold it in their account in US dollars until you see the uh, the Mexican peso in a, in a proper place and then pull that trigger and make an extra little bit of money if you want to do that. Is the Fed grabbing their share off the top? I haven't heard about that happening there. When you're making when you're making uh, purchases, from what I understand, a lot of times you have to ju jump through some hoops for that. From what I hear, I just checked. It's about 1,500 miles riding distance from Phoenix to there, which puts it about three. Say again. You need an FM three. Oh yeah, yeah. Is it FM two or FM three? I forget, sir. I, I think, don't know. Didn't they just change from the FM three? <laughs> you got a whole new system because they did something with the computer system a couple of years ago. Yeah, I heard about this. One thing Jim did is introduce me to his attorney, young guy named Enrique. He trusts him implicitly, and we talked about all of this. I'm going to go here to the to the embassy or the consulate here in Phoenix for Mexico. About $40 U.S., and that gets me my temporary visa. You've got 90 days to get there and establish yourself wherever it is that you're living. He's going to help me out for a few hundred dollars. He's going to make he's going to transfer that into a temporary resident card, which is good for one year. After that year, it will then be good for another three or four years after that, I guess you got to make a decision about whether you're going to stay there and uh, what you're going to do. Yeah. There's probably a public bus from Caratero to San Miguel. Yes, probably. absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. I've heard that's what a lot of people do. Reading a lot about the Mexican gangs on the highway yep. down there. Once you get outside of maybe the main towns, I mean, you're pretty much U.S. picking out. And God forbid you've got a car that looks better than whatever. It's, it's almost... I had that concern too about cars. My car is a 2010. It looks a little newer. It's a kind of nice car. Nobody who lives there seems to think that's an issue there. All of it has to do when it comes to getting down there to the border. There are other areas, the paths of the drug cartels that are of concern. 
they tell a story about this young couple who moved there. And so ah, they, they just started bopping around. Everybody said, where are you going? And they would, they would travel. They, you have to drive hours to get anywhere near that. There's no guarantees, guys. Um, but uh, this, again, you have to look at the statistics, and I encourage you to do that rather than just listen to me or anybody else. Yeah. I just want to know what your experience was. Um, the news coverage that we've been doing in Mexico, they're about ready to legalize drugs all over the entire country. Right on. Uh, how's that going? I haven't heard about that. No, I, I, I keep hearing that that may be the case, too. There was a thing on uh, drudge. They're considering, Mexico is considering having marijuana smoking drugs. You know, as a side here, you guys probably don't know, um, in Colorado, the guy that was really behind that guy named Joe B. Weeks, you may remember the world's longest limousine, Ron Paul limousine during the 08 campaign. I don't know if some of you guys remember. He's the one that owns that. He owns uh, also Manatech. He has Mountain Hours, you know, in Breckenridge, Colorado, their own currency. He has a bunch of, you know, a lot of things. Well, um, his family is doing very well. And he's only in his early 30s. Travels the world. He pays all. That's a long story. What happened is, is that. Um, uh, he goes to travel the world. He pays airline pilots. I'll give you ten thousand dollars to be your companion, whatever guy, because your wife only spent four thousand. You made six thousand. Make me your guy. So for thirty thousand dollars last year, he spent two million dollars to fly his first class. And he goes all the way, all check on baggage, all do, doing this. He makes the man feed orphanages and all that with uh, Vincente Fox. Vincente Fox and some billionaire buddies, which are probably drug cartel, they all whatever. They're coming to the United States to open marijuana dispensaries in Washington and Colorado and are preparing to do the entire North America. This is the president of former of company dispense marijuana. I know the suppliers. <laughs> he got, I think he got caught in front of the banks. He's taking the 10% funneling the gold money. I would not be surprised. So, so you can, I, I just want you to understand all the concerns that you have about the drug war and the cartels and everything. Who wants to keep the drug war more than anybody else? Law enforcement and the drug dealers. Right. Right. It's just, and all that's going away. Yes, are sir. you thinking of giving up your U.S. citizenship? At this time, I'm not. I'm not prepared to do that. I've met some people who've done that. Uh, I'm not going to adopt Mexican citizenship. Yeah. Maybe a, a visa. <clears throat> yeah, I, I'm not. I, I, I am looking at the, the concept of the like five flag theory, if you will. The, the idea that you want to become a citizen one place, have your money in another country, sort of vacation in another country, and you know some of the, those concepts. What a lot of people are doing in South America, ultimately I want to go to Chile, folks. I think it's the best place right now, personally, for me. Um, I'm just keeping my eye on, on a development that's going on down in Chile. But uh, a lot of people are going to Paraguay. Paraguay has no income tax, usually. Once in a great while, you know, they instituted it not long ago, 10%. Next year they said, no, we're good, we're not going to do it anymore. <laughs> I don't get that. So people are getting residency in Paraguay and living as a sort of permanent traveler, some, or perpetual traveler, they call it. World you call you it just, five, the five flag? Five flag theory, sometimes five or seven flag theory, yeah, you, you, you'll find that. There's, there's books what written about it. What is about Chile that's so like? Chile, well, first off, you pay attention to the Economic Freedom Index, which I kind of do. Is that Heritage <coughs> Cato or one of the groups yeah. does that? They're number seven. They are, no one in Latin America comes anywhere close to that. Um, Argentina's really cool if their currency didn't crash about every 10 years. <laughs> even cooler. Yes, sir. The George W. Bush family, I believe, has since purchased land in Paraguay. Yeah. Uruguay. High up in the mountains. Uruguay. 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 Tens of thousands of people. It could be Uruguay. High up in the mountains. And, and you know what? Let me do that. I didn't run down the list here. I didn't, if, if, did you have something else, sir? No, that's, oh, that's all I wanted to Let me run down my list here, uh, if you guys are interested in just hearing all the options here. In Asia, lots of great places to live. If you're rich, you can go to Singapore and Hong Kong. In some ways, it's incredibly free. In some ways, it's not. It's hot. Um, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, if you're not in Thailand, Philippines, Cambodia, Taiwan, I'm hearing people talk about Myanmar. Uh, you can live very inexpensively. My friend Jeff does a lot of traveling in, in, uh, in Asia. But opportunities to start businesses coming out of your ears. These people are not used. That's one thing we've got, guys, if you have a mind to start a business. All around the world, a lot of people just don't have that like Americans do. And we're respected. They see you and they're like, hey, we want you involved. And all of a sudden, you're sitting down with the president. You know, this is what my friends tell me. Um, Australia, especially New Zealand, 
are great places to expatriate. They speak English, and despite what you hear, I am told by everything I read it here, there is a really fair amount of freedom there. Central America, lots of people love living there. Panama, Nicaragua, Costa Rica. There's a, general, a young man there uh, at Libertopia over the weekend who has a development going in there. Um, they speak English, or excuse me, no, I don't know. No, no. it's, uh, it's very warm, it is inexpensive to live in most places there, and uh, a lot of pretty girls, Doug Casey mm -hmm. says. South America is very exciting to me. Hear a lot of people talk about Ecuador, Peru, Brazil, Argentina. Um, Uruguay is lovely. I have some friends who live there. My friends tell me it's not always extremely welcoming. They don't dislike you, but it's not so easy to get citizenship if you want to do that there. Paraguay has no income tax. That's beautiful, but it's hot and humid as hell. I had a buddy while I was down there hanging out in Chile who tried to move to Paraguay. He made it two months and he skedaddled back to uh, Santiago, Chile. Uh, Chile. So I was there for about three weeks earlier this year. That is my pick right now. Santiago is a wonderful, safe city. Do the research. Let me just finish talking about this, and then I'll go ahead. Um, <coughs> it is a first world city. I don't know if you would believe that. Very modern, magnificent places to go. Things seem to work here. Here's the funny thing about Chile. The police are surprisingly uncorrupt. I don't know why. It's just part of the culture. <coughs> If a cop is found out, I'm not talking about little stuff. There's probably little things where you can pay people off like they do every day in Mexico. But, but largely, if, if there's a big scandal, that cop will never work again. The family is shamed. It's just part of the culture. I don't know. It's interesting. Um, and they control it, with machine guns. Well, I, have, I, I didn't see that while I was there. That could be. That see could what? Be. Uh, see, see the uh, machine guns that the United States government bought recently oh. and, uh, and the tanks. Uh, <laughs> we'll take a look at that. Um, it is government uh, welcomes business-minded Americans right now. They will, if you fill out the forms and they think that you've got a good business plan, they will give you up to about $40,000 U.S. if you want to go there. It's interesting. I'm not saying that's a good idea for them to do that, but they're business-oriented there. It's sort of like it was here decades ago. They respect you if you build a business. They, they respect you. They don't think, well, who did you have to kill you know, to make this money? It seems to be the general uh, thing there. Central Chile will remind you very much of Southern and Central California. It's beautiful. Vineyards, mountains, rolling hills everywhere you go. Um, okay, so, yes? Uh, two questions. A couple minutes ago you mentioned a lot of places that are supposedly very free economically, particularly in Asia. Is it true that in a lot of those places, even though there's a lot of economic freedom, you can't walk down the street with a t-shirt that says the government sucks? Yes, and that's what seen. I meant. That's exactly what I meant. Yeah. You know, you hear about the guys getting caned for, for something, yeah. you know. And, yeah, th that is a concern in places like uh, Singapore. Yeah, qu and question number two is, that is it true that most of these places you just can't go walking around or carry guns in your car? Or can't walk around with guns or carry guns in your car? That is different everywhere you go. For instance, my friend Jeff Berwick was talking about this in Mexico. Yeah, it's illegal, but nobody cares. If you ever wonder why many people in Latin America look at you funny about when you talk about legal immigration or legal. The law is corrupt. They know what we know, but they just figured it out a lot sooner than we did. Legal? Who talks about legal? Are you on the side of the corrupt government? Is, is their attitude? They have guns. You know, they're, they're, they don't care about what the law says in that regard. Now, now Singapore and some areas of Asia you know, is a different story, and I, I, I can't speak with great authority about guns. There. Yes. Um, Two things, phone, and are you going to work? Like, so you I'll know, just work from my home. Okay. I just have a little recording studio. Just do and my what about work. like phone services, like cell phone? Oh, that's that? fine. That's fine. No issues. Internet. I mean, does it cost a lot more if you use your cell phone in other just, countries? Or do you know how no, it's, it, it, the plans are a little bit different. Most people in Mexico are not on their phones like us. They're just not. <laughs> Everybody's got a phone. They're just not walking around like zombies like I am. Um, and so they, the, the concept of having like an unlimited plan to most people in Mexico is just like, well, why in the world would you need that? They have them. It's not extraordinarily expensive. Um, I'm just wondering, did you probably be calling America? Yeah. Oh, there are expats down there who've got this down. A lot of them use they seem to love this magic jack. Some of them say it works beautifully. It does they, work. Well, it does. Yeah, yeah, and Twenty lot, bucks a year. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, and they say it works. They, they've got it down, and they've got the e-voice and all that, so they, they're able to talk to people or use Skype or whatever. There's a number of options. When I interviewed from South America, Jeff Borowick, yeah. it, it's all Skype. 
everything Skype. We have video, Skype, radio, do phone call, do an ad. We just kind of chop it. We'll just do audio. It's kind of, you know, the world's communication is it's totally different now, and it's going to be totally different two years from now. So, if I'm listening right, it kind of sounds like you're motivated because it's a maybe an adventure, and economic stuff. But I don't think I'm hearing anything political that you're better politically there or something. So you're not well, really running no, from this, this is, political thing, here, are you? This I wouldn't say running from it. From it okay. Well, maybe you could look at it like I'm running. I, I decided not to get deeply into all of those reasons. There are better people who can explain that to you, uh, maybe about what that. Your yeah, I well, mean, it, it is partially that. that. I, I, you know, I, uh, yeah. I would be okay with paying some taxes, sir, if I didn't see unbelievable, irresponsible spending. How in the world, you know? And so I, I, uh, I am looking forward to starting the top clock ticking on the foreign resident income tax exclusion. That's rather substantial. It's interesting. The United States is one of only two, you know, uh, sort of together countries in the world that taxes you on worldwide income. They're like, uh, most countries it's like, well, we're going to tax you here, but if you leave, what right do we have to do that? United States, we own your ass. Can you, but they do have this one little caveat, and that is, for 2013, I believe the amount is $97,600, the first $97,600 of earned income, you will not pay income tax. If you meet the time frame for being this is there. true, and you have to. There's a couple of different ways that you right. you achieve that. Right. Yeah. Did you answer? Um, I was just curious if you had um, reviewed Joel Stausen's strategic relocation material yeah. and all of this, yeah, yeah, and how yeah. all of that. If you did, how all of that may have played into your I, decision. I didn't read his book. It's very interesting. I think that's part of <laughs> the book yeah. is just so dense. It's yeah. tough to read through the whole thing. The I film know. is a good primer, though. I saw the film. Okay. And and so that would be Joel Stausen is an interesting character. Some people, he, he is interested in this with a view, a big picture view and a concern that all of the stuff that we see related to the Federal Reserve and, and, and all of the, the different things that are going on in the country is going to lead to very serious war. And uh, so his question is, what can you do if you're gonna stay in the United States? There are sort of homegrown advocates for you know weathering that storm. And if not, here are all the different places on the globe, and he's done a very complete job of them. I can't testify that he's the best guy to look to in this, but I was it was a compelling uh, movie and, and the information I read. Say, say the name again. <coughs> Joel Skousen, S-K-A-U. S-K-A-U. S-E-U. He was a speaker at Freedom Summit, Mr. Hand. And I didn't really know about him that much. Other people gave me books and so on. and, and, and uh, he was one of the most popular speakers that year. Everybody wanted it. I had no idea he had that much of a following. And it's all about where you live and why and your terrain and uh, the culture and everything. This is the one thing I wanted to, why I, I asked Jonathan to do this, is that he's representative of a lot of people. Woken up from a, a you know, be it your, because you're a religious society, a, a state, a family, you know, a political philosophy, a political party. You know, I mean, this is everybody either does or does not wake up to they were being manipulated and controlled. Once that happens, what kind of personality are you? What do you do with that information? You know, at the very least, you should not stop lying to yourself. And when you stop lying to yourself, then you start, you know, evaluating things and you make decisions. Well, some of your decisions may be tempered by, do you have grandkids? Do you want to include your family? Do they go in? Do you go, as a grandfather, do I go prepare some place for them knowing they're going to need it? What Jonathan has done is, I think he's done a really good job in kind of, look, you, you just, you take that one step. I mean, you at least learn what's going on and stop being afraid. The success of a lot of what's happening has been this claim of authority and the ability to make you fearful. Fear is the mind killer, and it has permeated this culture and certainly the next generation. And I saw it severed during the Lovolution when I would go to a, I want to demonstrate this. This is exactly what I'm talking about. I've told some of you this before, so bear with me. I go into a meetup like this in South Carolina, Iowa, Nebraska, New York, Washington, D, wherever the hell I was, traveling around the country, and just say, hey man, you know, Lucian, and this is how you make signs, we're gonna do it, who are the sign makers? 
and it was always <laughs> young people in 25 or younger in their teens over there that thought they were there to make signs. So we thought you're going to make signs. You're not making signs. So on YouTube, you're making signs. What the hell? You're not going to make signs? I mean, you know, I go, we'll get to you, take care of it. But all the other people, there would be people who would talk and pipe up and say what? Well, where do you get a permit to put the sign? <laughs> Where do you get a permit to give a finger to the man from the man? I mean, you know, I'd say, you know, can I have a permission slip to do? That was so stark to me. It was an age thing. And they, because it's a perspective, how much you don't do it, you go, ooh, punch a Zeke Isle. That's <laughs> legions too. You did not make, there's still, that flag on the football field, you could have made it a little bit bigger and included the end zone. Entire field about to be in the market. At least I know You know, this is a generational thing. And I can't get the over it. And I stopped trying. I do not care what you guys think. I can't spend the time on you. When we started doing I took over the Breakfast Club, what happened? They go, well, Ernie, you're going to send out and mail and do, and kind of I'm going, it's internet. If you don't got email, I sucks. You can't go to the webpage. I'm, I'm tired of bringing you guys along. I'm tired. I can't. There's too much at stake here. And this next generation, they already know this in here. They don't respect their authority. They have, why would they? What, what, what possible reason would they do it other than at six years old, they did the I Pledge Allegiance? That it? That's all you got? That's your whole game? What's the validity? What's the, the rationale? What's the logic? What's the reason? That you should do anything these people and give a crap what they say. They're making market decisions on their own individually. And there are people like Jonathan that are blazing the trail for his generation and others. And it permeates the internet. And all you have to do is ask the right question. Where, how, who, what, I want to, you do it and bam, like a Memorex commercial that blows your hair back of all the information that's available. And tens of thousands of people that have already done it say, the water's fine. And we are locked in indecision from fear. Doubt. It's true. And the government and the media, they are full of this. And the ratings of the cable news networks has plummeted so low. They're at the low. Face the Nation had the lowest ratings ever a couple yeah. weeks ago. And I'm like, big freaking deal. And the thing, they're going to bring back Crossfire. I know John Stewart's going to work that. <laughs> so, you know, what happened, they're so low now that with all of Fox, CNN, MSNBC, CNBC, Kramer, give me a freaking break. <laughs> so all these guys together don't even get 10 million. They're going, ooh, we had 300,000 watching. We, we rule out of 350 million. <laughs> And we give a crap what they think? It's over. You know, Wild E. Coyote over the cliff with a sign that says yucks. Okay? <laughs> it's done. You don't think it's going to happen. It already happened. So what we're doing is preparing for the people making this shift up here. It's a revolution between the ears. So we do a lot of stuff, self-sustained food. We're looking to we have some people, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, Michael and his wife, Bought, bought some land and kind of looking at how that might work and a place to go and you know in inexpensive ways of I don't die and I'll be there maybe it's like going to Mexico you'll be there you go somewhere else do whatever just I don't want to die but who do we go to Everybody, yeah well you can't nobody's I'm going BS he's sitting right there by the way folks I mentioned something to you earlier about San Miguel and about how some people say how'd you find this place not easy to find it. Well, there have been people who have been living there for you know very, very long, 80 years or something. Well, I mean, Americans have been going to that long. This is not necessarily true of people that are perhaps of a similar mind as us. They would be delighted to help you, give you whatever information you need. They're living there. They would love to see more liberty-minded people come to wherever these spots are on the globe. They're just dying to give you information. Sir? Okay, you found this town. Did you find any other towns in Mexico or other countries that really piqued your interest? Not personally. I hear there are a lot of interesting places. I just like this one. You know, I came to see that at some point in the last several, several years, like, admittedly, my life has been about making it comfortable. And this little town has got a lot of the stuff that I like to be in. Okay. That's why I like this. Oh, sir? Yeah, okay. okay, if the New World Order is going to take over the whole world, where are we going to run high? No, no guarantees, sir. That's what I'm telling you. Wasted time, sir.
Are you familiar with uh, Major Ed Dames and the remote viewing? Yeah. You're familiar with the Well, kill? I used to listen to Art Bell. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you familiar with the kill shot? <laughs> the uh, solar activity that's sooner or later probably going to... So, solar flare. That's what they say. South America, the southern hemisphere, there's no safe place to go. Just for the update. Fear, <laughs> doubt, indecision, you guys saturate. That's all right, sir. <laughs> Have you checked recently on the position of the Chilean and the Mexican government's uh, opinion on, on bombing Syria and bringing out World War III? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if they're being consulted. But, but I'm sure somebody has this talking to Have you seriously considered the thought that maybe after you're there for six months or a year, you're going to realize you're still you, whether you were here with your attitude, <laughs> you're there with your attitude and you're still wanting to go to work? What do you think? My reason for wanting to get out is not because I think I'll be another person, although what it would kind of be nice is if I could find a place where I could just stop talking about this shit. In my business, I've seen a few people, that, uh, whatever it seemed like in 10 or 20 years when they're they're in their life or something, they tend to come back this direction. Oh, sure, sometimes they do. Uh, yes, sir. So in other words, where you're at right now, the hell with you guys. I'm going. Well, I wouldn't say the hell with you guys, but I think I get your point. <laughs> yeah. This is what I want to do. This is where you. This is what you want to do. This is where you're at. And exactly. hey. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. I may have missed it. Did, did you say I could illegally on the phone and not end up in Mexican prison? Is that? <laughs> I, I wouldn't question? suggest that. I would okay. say that I know people who have made that decision, and uh, they seem to be okay with that. What was the question? I missed the question. Uh, can you own a firearm illegally possess. and yet possess and not and Stay not find yourself in prison? Oh, well, well, let me make one question. I'll come to you, sir. Uh, this is what Jim Carger always says. A lot of people have discovered, I think I said this on the show the other day, Ernie, uh, have come to see that the next best thing to a small government is one that's so jacked up that it's easy to kind of fly under the wire. Yeah. You know, um, sir. Um, for, for what it's worth, we have a book called Worldwide Gun Owner's Guide. Uh, 64 countries, oh. you can own a gun in all of them. Oh, okay. There's a way to apply Mexicans own guns, yes. shotguns for hunting, there's plenty yeah, of legitimate assistance. gun ownership. Um, how soon are you planning on moving? And well, what preparations are you making? And how is that going to work? Yes. Well, I, I, I thankfully, the best decision I ever made in my adult life was to hire this older woman named Jill, who was my professional organizer. And uh, she also used to be a, a vice president of Beacons Worldwide Moving, so she's helping me in this way a little bit. Just get my list together. She emailed it to me last night. This is all the stuff you need to get ready. So I'm going to be uh, selling a bunch of stuff. I have decided that I am going to store some stuff here in the Phoenix area. I don't know. I could end up back here. I don't rule that out. Um, and I'm going to take the rest of my stuff in a truck down there. Um, I have to get this Menaje de Casa. That is the name of the visa. That means I've just moved my house there. I can't be bringing in goods to be sold. They're going to be looking through stuff and making sure I'm not bringing in a bunch of new computers or something. But I have some people to help me with that, too. Um, so that's it. Uh, I have to, I'm going to go there. I've decided I'm going to go there and rent a place. There's lots of places. You go on a website called Airbnb or Craigslist, even down there, and you'll find all sorts of people who this is their business. Is people come in and out of there all of the time. And uh, I'll go rent a place for maybe a week or two or whatever while I look around for the place that I want to rent. When was that first website? Early November is when I'm going. It had, yes. Can you show UPS and, and, and like that? You can't, oh, yeah, let me talk about that for a minute, ma'am. Um, there's a company, this is what most people do down there. There's a couple of them, but the one most people use, it's called Solutions. And they have a, they basically have this back and forth thing between Laredo and San Miguel. Every three times a week, they will give you an actual address there, not a post office box, but an address in Laredo, okay? Now here's an interesting little funny thing that I have heard about Arizona. There may be some other state that does this. You leave Arizona and move to any other state, the state of Arizona will stop taxing you because you moved to another state. You leave the country, they're like, well, what state did you move to? You didn't move to another state. Oh, well, you got to pay a state income tax. It's a, it shouldn't be that way. It's a funny little quirk. So my plan is to change my address initially to Laredo, Texas, where there is no taxes, and I don't have to worry about that. And three times a week, they simply bring you whatever it is that, that you've received, you know. And if you want, you can have the service where they'll come and bring it right to your house. If not, you just walk up to the little uh, little place there and you pick up your stuff. Right. Uh, Ma'am. What was that first website you said before Craigslist? Oh, Air, 
BNB. AIR. Yeah. B-N-B. I believe it's BNB, not B and B, but BNB. I believe that's what it is. You'll find it. Uh, yes, sir. I think it was this fellow here that uh, mentioned about the uh, owning uh, firearms and being worried about going to prison. Um, my question is how. In the United States, prison is a private industry, commercialized, for-profit industry for the most part. They sign the contracts and stuff with the governments and they run the prisons under contract. How is it done in Mexico? And uh, I guess, I mean, do you know how well, many people are imprisoned in Mexico? And, and, I, I don't know, I guess it's a complicated question. Yeah, you're running the prisons in Mexico. Yeah, did you hear about that in Acapulco? <laughs> Chuck Berwick was talking about that. They had a little anarchist society going on in there. He was talking all weekend about how they went in there. There was drugs, and there was hookers, and there was guns all going on inside there. There was animals. There was a little bit of livestock. There was a peacock they found in the prison in uh, in, uh, in Acapulco. Yeah. Down there. Very yeah. Uh, sir, I don't, I don't know. What I am told by the people who live down there is that in that town, it's such a little gem cops pretty much stay away from Americans. They just don't want the potential hassle. This is not the case throughout Mexico. It would appear to be the case in this town. This is what they tell me. We hope you don't end up in prison. Right. Yeah, that's true, sir. Uh, I think I read an analysis book that yeah, you can buy a gun in Mexico through one store in Mexico. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Well, I'm sure this gentleman... I've got close friends down here in a little town territory on Santiago, that's the capital city, five million, um, magnificent city. If you drive about an hour and 40 minutes to the west is the coast. There is, yeah, Villa del Mar, you're familiar with me? Yeah, it's, a, it's like a little mini San Diego, very safe. I felt very comfortable there, very nice. Halfway in between is Curacaví. Curacaví is just wine country. Uh, there's uh, beautiful vineyards everywhere, it's just gorgeous. This particular project that Mr. Berwick, this is the Dollar Vigilante, I, I don't represent them really, but um, they have got something going on in there that right now looks really cool. I went and saw the property. I, I am taught, they call it Gulf Gulf Chile for you Ayn Rand fans. Yeah, kind of so cool. <laughs> yeah. The mountains are enormous. Everything grows there. They've already got all of the farms in there. It's just really, really beautiful. I love it. What, what I, to, to be perfectly frank, um, I just start thinking about a bunch of really fiercely independent-minded libertarians moving down there and like everything's just going to go swimmingly, right? I, you know, I just, I, I want to give it some time and watch it develop and make sure I understand what is the charter 
there, and I'm just going to let things settle down. I'm a little bit of a late adopter on this one, sir. I, I'm sorry, I thought you looked like you were going to say something. Well, I did have something. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I didn't raise my hand. I saw you were going like this. <laughs> When's this next earthquake, though? No. I don't know. <laughs> there was one in Chile while I was down there. I didn't feel it. Okay. It was a, Chile is a skinny little country, but I tell you what, the, the, the length of Chile is the same as the bottom of Alaska to mid-Mexico. Very long, but very skinny. He had my question. Oh. I didn't know they had earthquakes down there. Chile down is Chile. California. Yeah. Yeah. It's what California was in the 30s, 40s, or yeah. something. Yes. If you want to look, it's like here in Arizona, let me tell you what like Young is. It's what Prescott was 30, 40 years yes. ago. I mean, you know, you can see what's happening. And if you get there now and you start doing this, a lot of people are at friends that have bought hundreds of acres. And what happens is they see investments around the world of where they think movement is going to, where are prices going to go up and why. They don't look, okay, I want to share this with you real quick and while you guys are yakking, because uh, you can hear me over there. Mm -hmm. When we started doing the Freedom Summit, we were looking, my children were still under 18 and under my dominion. I mean, you know, as much as that can happen. So I'm going, what if we move? I mean, I, I could see after 9-11, I knew, man, but here we go. So we had people coming from New Zealand to talk about immigration there. We have people from Europe, people from South America. Even this one guy, they're talking about they built south of Cancun in, I mean, not Cancun, um, uh, Cayman Islands. And the Cayman Islands out there, there's hundreds of square miles where the average depth is like 30 feet. But because it's underwater, it's not claimed by any uh, um, country or anything. So what happens when you build a big giant airstrip on concrete pylons like you're doing piers off of Miami's coast? And you have this enormous condo doing kind of city starting to build you solid on the sea floor. I mean, you boom out there, you got your own country and done. Well, that's what he started doing. And I'm Prince De La, whatever the hell. Welcome to my kingdom. So all of this, we're thinking, you know, how would we do this? Now we have seasteading. They're trying to get, you know, free cities in Honduras. All this stuff is coming. So we're going, okay, um, where would we go? New Zealand was on there. Mark went down there for a month. Tour, talk to people. We got our email list. We've been going through this. And what we found out is that as free as New Zealand was starting to get, because they left, they were the first Western English-speaking democracy that went less socially. They, started to, they went socialist, and then they were the first to start abandoning it. They kept their national health care. But all the other stuff, they like, eh, this is not working. So Doug Casey went down there. He was big on New Zealand for a while. He came to Freedom Summit. He's talking about it. Then he went to Cafajate, which is an Argentina thing. But what we found out was it doesn't matter how great and wonderful the government is that week because a week later it's not. So you go, that's not the question. It's not the government. It's the people. It's the culture. How many generations, centuries, How? what is right and wrong according to them on the street? And you're right. There's going to be a goose-stepping, badge-wearing, you got a gun. But the people aren't ones turning in, don't give a shit. I don't care about the laws. I don't care about the government. I don't look to the one here. What makes you think I give a crap what they do? I look to the people. And when I look at things like Chile, all the people that I'm talking to, it's the people. They don't see government or the controls as legitimate. And what do we see about authoritarian sociopathy? What was the one experiment that they found when people of authority acted better towards the people? It was when the people didn't recognize their authority. And that's the difference in Chile. You know, mm -hmm. folks, uh, it, 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 what he said is, is so true. If you think about it purely from a real estate, if you, if you just go and <coughs> cast your eyes, upon some of this land down there and you glance over and you see these vineyards you're like people I, Adam Adam Carolla is a, is, does a podcast he's a comedian I listen to he always jokes that California is like a really pretty young girl who has never had to work for any attention it's not for anything good that this, the government of, of California has ever done but people like to go there because it's really beautiful and and you look at Chile and you just especially central Chile although a lot of people like the south too and you just think, man, at some point people are going to be snapping this up. So if that is of interest to you, the idea of getting in early, uh, 
that's a place to check out. Seriously, yes, sir. Well, I noticed you left out leaves. I've been studying yeah, leaves. Yeah, yeah, I did leave that out. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have. No marijuana laws, prostitution right. leaves between consuming adults and kids on the It's not human. Are it is away. human. And That's true. These are friendly, and they also fix flat tires for women. But I should have mentioned Belize. You're right. I actually have a former employee. She and her husband moved there, and they love it. Yeah. Well, they're pushing for Americans to come there and retire by Belize. It's a website now. And you're looking at that. So it's like the beach. Going on the beach is good. Good looking. It's about three. Do you have a problem? Yeah. I got to go. I got to go. All right. But we'll, we'll kind of wrap it up. Any final questions? We're over time. Go ahead. I was reading something the other day in Washington, D.C. If you're caught with an empty shell case and a shotgun shell case, you know, you're now going to be arrested for a felony. I'm going to get Washington, D.C. gun permit. Are you afraid thinking, enough yet? I kept thinking about Adam. I mean, is, it, is this a crap you worry about all the time? Well, I mean, when I read you know, this, I mean, you know, my face. Of course yeah. you do. I was thinking about of Adam. Of course you do. Adam. Adam Coe Cash is like 60-something days in jail. Fourth of July, he did the 12-gauge shotgun loaded in Washington. We will not be blah, 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 see you next July 4th. Oh, that boy didn't go to jail. And I, I am my good friend. We know each other since the beginning. And I tell you, the week before he did this, I had him on the radio, and I go, you know you're going to do five years, right? I mean, you know this. I don't, do you need? You got a book deal you're doing? You got a movie you, you're going to be making? Is there? I mean, is there some reason why? You, because I would have done it different. I would have had showed his, you know, like marine dress with the white gloves, and <laughs> done the same thing, and showed it, and did, didn't see my face, and then got it down, and then came on camera and go, hey, yeah, you know, did the same thing, and then you had the camera spin around again, and there's like a, a dozen marines in dress blue with you know white scarves, kind of you know, those are all the thing. You know, which one? I want a trial then, but I'm not going to help them. I'm not going to be on silver platter and serve myself up. I, 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 I had disagreed, but he may have another plan. I hope so. But he's going to be doing his plan in jail, I'll tell you that. John Stewart, those of you who know, just convicted this last week, guilty, second degree murder. Really? What? No shit. You know who John Stewart is? Daily, Daily Show? No, 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 no. <laughs> a friend of ours named John Stewart, this is what happened. Oh. Putting up signs right around here in Cape Creek. <laughs> On um, uh, Super Bowl weekend, when the Patriots and Giants were here during Ron Paul 08, and they had the tournament player, you know, the uh, Phoenix Open was going on, they had big parties and so on. Putting it up, this guy is kind of weaving and so on. He just gets around speeds, goes up, they got a little, you know, ouch quit it, altercation. Guy blew a .19, okay? This guy, on his blog, yeah, I like getting all roided up and go out and kicking ass and doing everything. I mean, this is all, you know, how he is. He gets out of his car, goes over to his trooper, starts choking John Stewart, beating the crap out of him, boom, a gun goes off, hits the guy in the forehead, drops dead, they charge him with second degree murder. And the whole case came down and go, well, did he really feel his life was in danger? I mean, you know, I mean, it's just seriously. So they had a hung jury, that was why it's taking so long, they had a hung jury on the first one, and it was because one juror, a woman goes, I know from personal experience, the police Oh, yeah. No, not guilty. Oh, you got it good. Not guilty. You guys been we'll be here for freaking years. Not freaking guilty. Sons of bitches, they lie. Okay. Hung jury. Do another trial. He was happy with his defense. Got to say what he wanted, but the people were like guilty, 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 guilty. And the reason was, well, we we think maybe he was backing up when you shot. You know. You know. So all this stuff, there's so many things wrong with this case. We'll, we'll see what happens. There, of course, appeal and all this other stuff. But that is a perfect example. Guy gets out of the car, blows a .19 drunk, choking you, he's dead, and you get charged with second-degree murder and convicted eventually. So what am I looking at? The law? I'm looking at the culture of the people that sit on that jury. Poor Dyer, when they select a jury, you know, Vincent Prentowitz called that French for jury stat. <clears throat> so I am much more interested in what Jonathan's doing as an individual, making whatever decisions. Yeah, but what about this? But what about that? And I'm going, every single one of your points or questions you bring out about how bad it might be somewhere else, I'm going, don't you read the local news? <laughs> 
Are you kidding me? Fear and doubt. Your victims. The only people that are inoculated and insulated from this are the young people that sit in the back of their room in a classroom like this. You got a teacher up here. There's one kid back there. You're a teacher, Dave. I mean, you know, it's kind of you're, you're coach. You did. You know, I'm going. What are they doing? You say anything? They go. Oh wow, my bullshit meter just went to here. <laughs> Mandatory youth indoctrination camp bullshitter. Okay. It's so over. We have to prepare for what's next. And what's next is an entire generation of people that are going to free themselves just by a moment realization and thinking it that they are not obligated to be your slave to pay for all this entitlement you voted for yourself to have them already before they even get into the workforce got to turn over half of what they make just to kind of keep the hamster just going on the wheel it's going to fall off anyway they got you know tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of dollars in a student debt for a promised job that's not there and they got the debt and knowing this was coming, what the Congress do? You can't do bankruptcy on your student loans. You're a permanent slave in this country. That's it. That's so I'm going, and if you're eating the man's food, you know, using the man's money, you know, getting in, you know, the mood that we have. I had a woman on yesterday talk about EMF. It's emfdoctors.com. Her whole thing is like this soup that we're in is changing the TV. Everything it's intentional. Smart meters yeah. got to have it. Why? They got you know voices in your head and everything. Maybe, but what they all all they need to do is just you know amp up the fear a little bit, so that when you see that trailer for a movie of you know nightmare on the street with a knife, whatever the hell it is, you know you watch. I don't even need to see a damn movie. I'm freaking scared. I can't go to sleep for three hours from thirty seconds of a trailer. <laughs> you know, so it's just I, I go see an R-rated movie at the movies and everything. Me and my son-in-law, we're just saying our whole family. I'm just like, you know, seriously, la 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 la. You'll bite me. <laughs> I used to love to go early, see the trailers for the movies coming. Oh my goodness, I go see an action film. I gotta go see, you know, like you know, like blood splattered on the screen and stuff. And hell, I don't even need to see the movie. I'm screwed up. <laughs> but God forbid you show cleavage. You get a little nip slip or something, man, you're going to the Supreme Court on that one. <laughs> Can't have that. That'd be wrong, you know? Now, it, 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 what's the, the high school movies? I tell you, you know, you want to have you know teenagers having sex at the camp and they're just doing it and getting it on. That's okay as long as Jason comes up with a big spear and <laughs> sticks him to the ground. Well, it's okay. You think I'm kidding? No. There was a movie, a documentary called This Movie Is Not Yet Rated. And it was all about the rating system I had. It's a psyop. This has been going on since yes. for freaking ever. This is like pyramid people stuff, okay? This is, you know, here they, the secret handshake, let me tell you what it is. It is. What new technology we got to control everybody now? Eh, eh, eh. The goal is the same. Your livestock. And when you start to free your mind, like Jonathan has done, and said, you know what? I've made the decision, maybe not here. Maybe over there, maybe, I'm going to go, I'm going to, 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 I'm going to take a first step. Just that first step. Who are the people saying, I'll tell you what you are, you're bucket crabs. When the one crab, you got a whole bucket full of crabs, and the one guy's, he's going to get out, he's trying to yank him and pull him back in the bucket. Why? Why aren't they helping? Why aren't they pushing him out? Why isn't every freaking crab out of that bucket? Because bucket crabs pull guys like Jonathan back in because it makes them feel better. Misery loves company. <laughs> Frank. <laughs> All right, go. Okay. Je um, Ernie, quick, regarding John Stewart's situation, wasn't there actually a bunch of blood and brain matter on the inside of his car, which would... There was all kind. This all came up, and it's just amazing how... You know, I don't want to get into it because I don't know, and I was hoping we could do a show on um, We probably will. And, but, and you said that the guy blew a, a point one nine. Oh, yeah, no, he was extreme to you. Uh, wasn't that from the autopsy because it's pretty hard for a guy to do a blood Oh, no, 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 it's stipulated. They go, no, so? <laughs> He's dead, though. Somebody's got to go, like, to jail, you know? And so, anyway, it's, it's a messed up case. Jonathan, thank you very much. You know, great job. You know, hopefully, Jonathan, you're after a couple minutes, you can say, yo, what's up? They're done. Frank's got to do his business. Go ahead. <laughs> Before you start, I just have one question. I think I got everybody over here paid for, so I just have you guys all individual. Okay. One. Two. Three.
You pay. Okay. So just one, two, three. I'm going to put one of these up here. What do you guys are going to do? want this? I highly recommend this. But I need these, so, you know, I'll leave one here. Is there another one of these? Okay, well, that's good enough. I need okay, first chance is the folks go? First chance is 3569. 3569, first chance number. <laughs> Where are they? They're all on the side. You're stacking up. I got two tickets. You want the first one or the second one? We'll, we'll, we'll randomly drop one okay. here. Just to make it legitimate. Okay. 3580, second choice. Hey, Carol. Yeah, hey, 3580. Right. Yeah. Way to go. Okay, last chance for for the book is yes. three five seven six. Three five seven six. Alan Webb. Alan Webb. We'll go hey, Got to be here to win. See a pack to draw it up. We'll be sure to remind him of that next time. <laughs> yeah. Makes the odds better. <laughs> Just start more trouble. Three five six eight. Okay, six. Five, six, eight. All right, Michael. Yeah, a little bit uh, get off my chest while I'm here. I know several people that are working very hard to get two passports. In case the one in the United States isn't any good anymore, he's got another to get out of town. They also are working very hard to put some of their money in their foreign bank account. In case we have a deal like the Cyprus. Yeah. Here, Poland this week just confiscated half of all the private pensions. Oh, this week. It's coming here. It's coming here. It's coming here. Oh, yeah. All right, guys. Thanks for coming. We'll see you where next time? I don't know. We'll find we out. Know. We'll plan. You know, I need to check the website. <laughs> website. Sorry. You know, that's just the way it is. Thank you very much. Hope you learned something. Anybody who had to sign the petition, we should kick out all the illegals and get our Americans back to Austin. The only reason they like this anymore is because they think they don't want money.